Wokeness is priming Americans to turn to Christ. Where has Mario Murillo been? Many of you know him to be a regular guest on other Christian programs, but he has been conspicuously absent for some time. I'm about to ask him about that, and listen, his answer is going to shock you. Plus, he is going to issue a harsh rebuke to the prophetic community and lay down a new paradigm for the Church of Jesus Christ heading into this year. This interview is going to change your life. He's an evangelist. He's a prophetic voice, a best-selling author, the founder of Living Proof Ministry. Here's Mario Marilla. Mario Marillo, welcome back to Encounter Today. It's so good to have you. Alan, I can't tell you how excited I am. I think we're going to have an, a, a very explosive program. Absolutely, because there's a lot to talk about, and you, God has just lit a fire under you about what's happening in America right now. And I, I want to talk to you a little bit about how you are right now currently exposing the most explosive undercurrent taking place right now in the nation that will decide the fate of our nation. But before we get to that and what the Lord has shown you about that, you have been conspicuously absent. People are familiar with seeing you on many different programs, seeing you all, all over the place, uh, and they want to hear what you have to say. But lately, we haven't really seen you as often as we like seeing you. Uh, where have you been? I have been uh, in a reflective uh, state seeking God because I felt that I needed to address some abuses in the prophetic movement. Mm. And uh, I felt like there's some people that think an evangelist shouldn't do that. They don't realize how qualified we are to deal with abuse and discernment. You know, I spent 10 years at the University of California. I've written several books, and I've led many, many classes on theology, and I was an adjunct professor at a school of theology. Mm. So... The idea that I don't understand scripture or don't have background is, is kind of fallacious. Mm -hmm. The fact is that somebody needed to speak out and I needed to wait. And the blog that we came out with today, which is now approaching 50,000 reads wow. just from this morning, has to do with visitations to heaven that aren't real, mm -hmm. uh, statements of how prophets have codes for the Bible that they think we need to know. And they basically say, we, the prophets, understand the Bible and you can't without us. And that's what the Catholic Church said in the Middle Ages. So I, I took it and uh, I was appearing regularly on a show that many of people know. And uh, one of the other individuals who was with me on there, not Lance Wall now, he's a man of God, powerful, anointed man of God. But another one was condoning it, and I'm going to withhold comment until I can uh, get with him again. And I said, you know, you're endorsing two false prophets. Hmm. Well, well, one is a false seer and the other is a false prophet. And I said, you need to step away from them re or rebuke them, speak into their life. But right now, we have a lot of self-proclaimed prophets, Alan. They're running around and they're giving daily words like it's a horoscope and it's not God. And so I did write the blog and rather than to get into it here, which wouldn't be necessarily fair, they could yeah. go to mariomarillo.org and see the blog yeah. that is called Mario, Where Have You Been? And I'll explain it. Well, you go into it in detail, and the link for your website to that blog will be in the description of this video. And I, I, I can ask you this question, and I don't feel like I'm gossiping because I honestly have no idea who you're talking about because I don't watch Christian television. Uh, but when I read what you had to write about what was being said and the visions that were being had, I just I couldn't even believe myself. I couldn't even believe what I was reading. I felt like, okay, he's making this up. Like, this this can't be true, and yet somehow it is, and it's being embraced by a large portion of the church. So without addressing this specifically, can we talk for a second about the prophetic community and the need? Right. There's an addiction right now. It seems like there's this fascination and addiction with receiving a prophetic word. Where does this come from? How can we heal and get healthy uh, in response to this kind of tomfoolery? You know, you know what it is, Alan. It's called uh, prediction addiction, huh. and 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 that's what it is. It's a prediction addiction. And there, William Shatner appeared in an old black and white in the early '60s episode of Star Trek. Um, excuse me, Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone. I'll get my shows right. 
Well, he was, of course, in Star Trek, but in this episode of Twilight Zone, he plays a young man who he and his newlywed break down in a small town. And while they're waiting to get their car repaired, they go into a diner. And there's one of these uh, mystical uh, machines where you can put in a quarter and ask it a question and it'll answer it for you. And all of a sudden, uh, they find themselves getting answers that are kind of spooky, like this machine really is aware of what we're doing. And they got addicted to it and kept feeding coins into it. Hmm. But what they didn't realize, and the point of the episode of Star Trek was that you're, you're, you can't allow that to control your life. And so when they left the restaurant, they had a big argument. The wife said, quit putting money into that thing. That, that's crazy. You shouldn't believe this stuff. You should make choices and be rational. Well, that's what's happening to Christians. They are literally leaving their Bible, having out of Bible experiences mm -hmm. and trusting in prophets that will give them a daily word. And they're wrong. And he, here's the most dangerous part, Alan. These prophets make predictions that do not come true. And everyone just sweeps it under the carpet and moves on. And they don't discern or evaluate it. And they don't realize that all of, you know, all of the things they need are in the word of God. Come the on. Bible will tell them yes. what they need to do with their life. And when you ask God to talk to you, I, I'm going to tell you about God for a second. Go ahead. If you, if you say, God, speak to me, he won't if you're not reading your Bible. Hmm. Because he's not going to reinforce the habit of you getting direct impressions from God without knowing the word of God. It's when, this is why Jesus said, those who hear my word and put it into practice are like the man that built his house on the rock. Mm -hmm. You're building on sand when you have diminished the words of Christ to a talking point that is a partial uh, part of your diet, but not the central source of your, it, of your revelation. Reading the Bible is everything. And, and everything we're running into today, whether it is our, our uh, um, dysphoria about sexual sin, our inability to understand why abortion is wrong, our, our inescapable confusion uh, and moral morass is all tied to the fact that Christians are no longer getting sound doctrine God. from the pulpit. It's so true. It's and so I, true. Let me tell you how serious it is, Alan. The other, the, it was about a month ago, I was reflecting on all of the healings of cancer that are being verified by doctors, mm. the healings of those who were paralyzed that have walked out of our tent healed by the power of Christ. And I was rejoicing in it. And all of a sudden, Alan, the Holy Spirit said to me, unless you teach sound doctrine, I'm going to stop doing these healings. Oh, my goodness. And I thought, what a, what a remarkable thing to say. I'd never heard the Holy Spirit say that. But it became clear when I read the writings of Paul that we need to fundamentally return to the doctrines of the blood of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the book of Romans to understand what it means, what grace is, mm -hmm. and why the Bible is inerrant, all of these things. And why did the devil so easily deceive the church in this modern era? They had no firewall from scripture uh, and pastors were guilty yeah. because they traded church growth hmm. for discipleship. For, they said, I don't want to go through the steps of discipling people. I'd rather just have a crowd. And that's where we are. And that's how we got here. And it's no wonder now that we are a literal wilderness free for all of people believing in all kinds of things that are absolutely not only non-scriptural, but anti-scriptural. Yeah, and people have to read your blog to see exactly, it'll blow your mind. Everybody needs to read the blog because what's being said, you would not believe it if we told it to you. And it seems like we are 
constantly peppered with prophetic words telling us that we need to get back to the Bible, yet none of these prophets actually take us back to the Bible, which is why your book, your new book, It's Our Turn Now, is so important. It, it, it's, it's taking us back to the Word of God and giving us action items of what we need to do, which is what I want to get into now here for a second. And ladies and gentlemen, this book, It's Our Turn Now, could be the most important book Brother Mario has ever written because it's not only yeah. going to give you the word for what's happening right now, and I know it's up on your screen, the book, you can see it right now. The link is in the description. Get it get it while it's hot. Go to Mario Murillo's website and get it, and it's going to show you not only what the Lord is saying, but exactly what you need to do step by step. So, Brother Mario, in this book, you start exposing the undercurrent of what's actually taking place in America right now, and it's, it's actually what will decide the fate of our nation. What are you talking about in, in the book? It's okay. Right Thank you, Alan. I'm going to get to it right ahead. I believe that the greatest harvest of souls in American history hmm. is not only about to happen, but it is happening all around us right now. And you know how I came to find out? We had a pandemic in California, just like the rest of the world. Yeah. Governor Gavin Newsom locked down our crusades. I defied him and went ahead and did a citywide crusade in Fresno that set the tone for us to go up and down the what I call the corridor of glory, that to the north is Sacramento and to the south is Bakersfield. We're taking our tent up and down Highway 99. Thousands of people are being saved. Mm. When we were in Hanford, California, which is about 25 miles southwest of Fresno, we had 4,000 people in attendance every night when it was 40 degrees outside. Uh. And the people did not fit into the tent. So they're standing and they're seated outside the tent in a chair, shivering, but refuse to leave because they want to hear the gospel. Drug addicts, gangsters, people that are suicidal, every kind of human devastation from the wealthiest to the poor, standing together at the front of that tent being saved. And I wanted to know why this was happening. And I went to John 4.35, and it said, do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? But I say to you, look around you, vast fields of human souls are ripening. And I went and prayed about that. And the first thing I heard in my research in prayer, wokeness is priming Americans to turn to Christ. Because wokeness is the perfect ingredient for desperation. Okay. Wokeness takes the color out of life. Wokeness makes you suspicious. Wokeness raises the bar of what is social justice until it's parsing words and syllables and nuances. And there's racism under every chair. There's something offensive. There's something not right. There's something environmentally inappropriate. And I'm constantly realizing that this is the greatest new legalism in American history is wokeness. Wokeness is perfectly mirrored in what Jesus said to the Pharisees. He said to them, and I, I need to get this point across. He said, you measure out these spices like cumin and cinnamon, and you tithe them, but you've forgotten the greater issues of the law, justice and mercy and truth. This is how it looks. Wokeness does the same thing. It takes the unessential morals and parades them. What my generation put a man on the moon. This generation put a man in the girl's bathroom. That's how it works. Yeah. And wokeness doesn't do anything but make you completely. I don't, you know, I'm going to say it this way. If you look at what Disneyland was when it was woke and it's now pulling out of it because Bob Iger, who is the, the new leader of Disney, understands the stupidity of the fight they, they started against Florida mm -hmm. and the way they position people. Oh, if you wear a mask. Oh, if you drive a Prius. Oh, if you say the right words, then you're a moral person. Well, all of that has made people nauseous, angry, 
And even though the media oppresses them, millions of Americans have, are coming to the same thing. Think of an orchard. Mm -hmm. if, if you're growing apples, you have to know when they're going to ripen. And you have to realize that there are entire sections of your orchard that are ripening while others aren't. And you had better be ready to go in there and get it. And God said to me, focus entirely on soul winning. You can always go back and teach. You can always go back and write books. But right now, people are ready to get saved. So flash forward to Bakersfield. I'm preaching. One of the most notorious drug dealers in the city is, is under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He's literally writhing in pain. He runs to the front with about $10,000 worth of marijuana buds of the highest grade you can get. Mm -hmm. No leaf, just buds. And he takes this bag and throws it on the ground and he screams at me, I can't do this anymore. And he waves at me and he says, I must have Christ. We have that video, by the way, of his conversion. But that began to be repeated over and over and over again. This young man has just surrendered this bag of marijuana. He said, I'm delivered. That's my downfall. That's my downfall. Smoking, selling. You can't serve two masters. That's what he said. Like, it's the truth, right? He, Jesus, the truth. I wouldn't be talking to y'all if he wasn't the truth. Here's the embarrassing part, and then I'll stop because obviously That's I've so good. <laughs> it's so good. taken a while to say this. It is essential for every pastor to understand that there are thousands of people who want to be saved. They don't need the proverbial big screen, skinny jeans, and fog machines. They don't need designer coffee to impel them to go to church. They don't need valet parking. They need men and women of God to preach an unadulterated, unapologetic gospel. Spurgeon said, don't mention the gospel. Don't talk about how great the gospel is. Direct the gospel. Hit them with the gospel. Go directly at the audience with the gospel. And I'm doing that. And the results are surprising, to say the least. They are really, tr truly amazing. And well, that's why I, I went to this book. Yeah, it, it's out there now. I'll, I was reading it today, and one of the lines I wrote down when I was reading it was, instead of a towering presentation of the gospel, it's presented in fits and spurts. The outsider is surprised when the preacher suddenly switches gears into an oh-by-the-way altar call and when you go into and again i mentioned that this is a this is a how-to yeah. manual three things you must do to take your turn you go into we must win souls now and you've been practicing this and i wanted you very quickly to tell our audience about joe because i think right now in this moment this 19 year old who came into your crusade is a great example That's right of what you're talking about okay so we put our tent in fink white park in fresno an area so dangerous that none of the local residents go out of their homes at night. And so we were told that if we put a tent there, no one would come because once, this, once it got dark, they wouldn't come out of their house. Well, we were shocked. We put up the tent and they came from everywhere. And one afternoon, a young man's driving on Highway 99 to his job at a pizza parlor. And he hears a voice say, get in that tent. Our tent was right up against Highway 99, so it was visible from the freeway. He pulls off. It's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And he sits there, calls his boss and say, I can't show up for work today because I'm supposed to go to this tent meeting. And his boss says, if you don't show up, you're fired. He said, well, I guess I'm fired. Now, here's the condition. He's a heroin addict. He's got cirrhosis of the liver. He's got kidney damage. And he's sitting in his car waiting, and the crowd is showing up. Many of our crusades start an hour early because all the seats are gone. So there he was in the parking lot. And he comes in and gets a seat on the aisle about five rows back from the middle, the middle aisle, 
I'll never forget. I know right where he was seated. And I'm standing on the side waiting to go on as the last worship songs being sung. And it, so I walk in and, I, and I'm getting a download. Here's a young man, cirrhosis of the liver, heroin addiction, kidney disease. I want you to, before you preach or do anything, walk up to him and ask him to stand and tell him what I've told you. So I do. I do what I'm told. I go down the aisle. I said, young man, stand up. I said, what's your name? He said, Joe. He's 19 years old. I said, Joe, are you addicted to heroin? He hangs his head and he nods yes. And I said, do you have cirrhosis of the liver? He kidney disease. He's checking all the boxes. Yes, yes, yes. And I said, well, son, the first thing that's going to happen to you is the demonic power that addicts you to this thing is going to be broken right now. And he went through a deliverance. Then standing there, I prayed the sinner's prayer with him. He is now converted and born again. Hmm. I turn around like I'm going to do a little victory march when the Lord said, where are you going? You're not done yet. I turn around and I can't believe what I'm saying now. I put my hand on his chest between the top part of his stomach and his chest. And I said, young man, you're going to feel something coming out of here. And it is the power of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to speak a language that you don't know because you're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I gave him the absolute express lane teaching on the baptism. And all of a sudden, this beautiful language starting to come out of him. And it's, it's even infinitely more beautiful because it's coming out of a former addict's spirit. And so I put the microphone to his mouth. I admit it. I put the microphone down there so everyone in the tent could hear his prayer language. And it sent a shockwave through the tent. I would, I would to God that every one of you watching could have been there that moment because it, it shifted it all. Listen, what you're hearing right now is life-changing, and everybody needs to hear this message. And you can help us make that possible. All you have to do is click the thumbs up button. How hard is that? All you have to do is hit the share button. That's not complicated. And comment below. Let us know where you're watching from or what you're believing for, because we want to pray with you here at Encounter Ministries. We can't thank you enough for partnering with us and helping us get the message out. So right now, before you forget, share, like, comment. In Jesus' name. Well, this is what's happening by the thousands in these crusades. And now you're coming to the East Coast you're coming to the Carolinas. You're going to be in Winston-Salem. But first, you're going to be in Bakersfield, California. What are the dates for yes, the Bakersfield sir. Crusade, by the way? March 12th through the 15th. And it, we have got 10 flat acres near the freeway that we, we have rented. And it's 1700 Golden State Avenue. And we'll start 630 every night. It'll be Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at 630 in Bakersfield, 1700 Golden State Avenue. And people can it's sign up be, to volunteer. They can sign up to be a part by going yes. to your website. All that they need to know. And if anyone is watching from the Bakersfield area, there's a brunch for pastors on February the 4th at CityServe. It's a downtown Christian outreach that's amazing. And they have a banquet hall. We can handle up to 800 people. We have 500 registered right now. But they're welcome to come to that free and uh, learn some things that God is telling me about California. Well, if people want to learn not only what's happening with California, but how to take this nation back, it seems like we're losing America. Are we losing America? Can we, can we pull it back from the brink, do you think? I tell you that I really, I truly believe that it, it, is, a, it is a good news, bad news and I'm going to give the bad news is we've already lost our country. We've wow. lost it. We, you know, I think Tucker Carlson said it as well as anyone. We have, we have been the victims of a coup that we couldn't see. Hmm. Someone took over our country. Yeah. And it's very easy to understand that. You just try and oppose the regime that controls our nation right now. How in the world can you think you live in a free country when 
if you have an opinion on the vaccine, you can lose your job, have your YouTube channel shut down and be slandered and and have your your address and your money confiscated. This is this is banana republic stuff. But that's where we live. That's the bad news. The good news is, is that in American history, God has done supernatural things to save us when we didn't deserve it. And uh, there, I, I can tell you about 17 key moments in American history where we were finished as a nation. And then at the last minute, something happened. I'll just give you a microcosm. The, George Washington had to cross the Hudson River. He's got to get back to New York City, and he is being chased by a far superior British army. And the Redcoats are not only coming, they're upon them. Now, they've got to drop down a cliff, get in a series of rowboats to cross the Hudson to get over to New York. And, and they are a shooting gallery. They are dead to rights. All they got to do, the British, is stand and line their men across that ridge and fire down at the Continental Army and wipe them out. Until, while they're climbing down, a blanket of fog comes out of nowhere and covers the entire Hudson River and till the American army makes it across. Now we're looking for something like that. And here's what's happening. The greatest undercurrent in American history is the mass ripening of souls that are sick of the perversion, sick of the, 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 spoiling of everything that is decent and good and right. The exaltation of perversion, the false teaching that is being forced on their children, their rights that are being overruled, their individual privacy that's being wiped out. It's a mass volcanic eruption that's about to occur. And the church isn't ready. Hmm. We're not ready to receive the harvest. And it is exactly what Jesus said. The harvest is great. The labors are few. We've been trained as preachers to see America as so sophisticated, so anti-God. We look at these, these puppets on TV and think they're the stereotype of what America thinks. Nobody but God knows what America thinks. Hmm. None of the statistics are right. None of the demographics are right. That's why I was ill-prepared to stand in my pulpit in my tent and try to explain why sometimes 800 to 1,000 people are standing there crying, wanting God, because it's a nationwide phenomenon, and the book will help you to know how to embrace it, to find your place in the harvest, to how to leave what I, in one instance I said, you're not a turkey, you're an eagle, and the, the, the Compromised church is a vast turkey yard. You're an eagle. You wonder why you look up at the sky while the turkeys are pecking on the ground, why you want to eat meat and not corn. And this is what's happening. There's a remnant inside the body of Christ that while God is working one side of the street by making a generation frustrated to want God by the millions, he's also working within the church with a remnant that is walking out of church saying, this isn't it. This is not, this is the system of the world that is Christianity incorporated. This is a man's ego in the pulpit building an empire. And it has nothing to do with moral awakening or miracles or transforming our culture. Those two forces are about to collide yeah. and it's going to end up in a massive harvest because it's our turn now. What I use as a model is Elijah. I talk about how Elijah challenged an entire nation to make a decision. He told Ahab, he said, I want you to call Israel. Imagine this, one minute he is being hunted down by every assassin in Israel. Ahab and Jezebel have hired every killer they can find to track down the man of God. They can't find him. Even after he raised the dead, they couldn't find him. Even after he multiplied the oil and the wine. And I talk about in the book, why did he go to where he did Zarephath, the widow of Zarephath? That's where Jezebel was from, in the nation of Sidon, hmm. in the region of Sidon. It was like God sent him to hide in the very birthplace of the problem. 
Wow. That's why the, the miracle America is going to see, man won't be able to take credit for it because it's going to shock people. You realize, Alan, that the two greatest crusades we've done have been in California and New York. We didn't. And the third greatest was in Colorado Springs. We have yet to do a major crusade in a, in a red state. All of them have been in blue states. And why? Because that's where the orchard is ripening right now. Wow. So, and in the book, by the way, in that chapter, you talk about the Elijah's mistake that I want you to share with us here in a second. But when you mention the coup we never knew, which the church is wholly un unaware and unprepared because they don't know what's going on around them, we decided to set up a news site called EncounterNews.com where people can go daily and find news that matters to them, that's important to them, that will help them pray and inform them. And we posted there the article by Victor Davis Hansen about the coup right. we never knew that I encourage every Everybody go to EncounterNews.com and get what Brother Mario referenced because it's, it's eye-opening to say the least. But let's talk about this because in the book you go into not only Elijah's victories, but what was his mistake? Okay, Elijah's mistake is the one we've got to avoid most of all. Imagine that he's standing on the mountain with arguably the purest demonstration of supernatural power yes. next to the Red Sea that we see in the Old Testament. The fire comes down, consumes 40,000 gallons of water, a swimming pool, all of the rocks, all of the wood, all of the offering. It is taken up. It's literally disintegrated. It vaporizes right before their eyes. Elijah's thought at that moment was, Surely, this is going to make all of Israel repent. Hmm. And he did have a measure of transformation in the people, but he lost sight of something. When a culture has poisoned itself so long and so deeply, you have to remember that what they were doing in Israel is they were believing in Baal and Jehovah at the same time, and they would fluctuate between them. Sometime they'd go offer Baal an offering. Sometime they'd offer Jehovah an offering. But they were confused. That morass, the swamp, is what we're in now. It's amazing who calls himself Christian. It's amazing who says, well, I'm born again, but I believe in abortion. I believe in this. I believe in LGBTQ. It, it is evident. So when the Spirit of God fell, Elijah thought, now they're going to recognize me and I'm going to lead a national movement to transform it. So his disappointment, his devastation, the fact that there was this vacuum was inside of him, set him up for what would happen next. You notice that when Ahab went back and told Jezebel about what happened on Mount Carmel, all right, Imagine if a flying saucer landed on top of the Empire State Building. Okay. And the New York Times says there was an electrical problem on the top floor of the Empire State Building because they don't want to admit that there are flying saucers. That's exactly what Ahab did. Hmm. He went back and the Bible says he reported all that Elijah had done in killing the prophets. He left out the story of the supernatural. He left out the part about the flames consuming everything. I'm, I go into detail in the book about this moment. And why is that important? Because I am certain that Jezebel would have hesitated to be as bold as she was if her husband had told her, actually, girl, fire came out of nowhere and ate up everything, and it was God. Instead, she said, I'm gonna to do to you what you did to the prophets, I'm gonna kill you. Now, her not knowing what God had done, and he not being aware that revival is not a one-step deal, but it is a protracted contending for truth, that, that mutual mistake made him run for his life. It says when he saw what she said, he ran. That's what we can't do. There'll be millions saved, but the job of restoring America 
that'll only be the beginning. Mm -hmm. We can't stop there. We've got to understand how to think locally. How do, how do we get on school boards and influence culture and get pastors who are going to lay it out about why do we have this hope? What does it mean to be a Christian? Why is Christianity superior to all of this garbage that wokeness is presenting? We've lost the argument for all the wrong reasons. Hmm. You know, Finney said this. He said, theaters are full, churches are empty, because the church tells the truth badly, and the world knows how to lie well. Yeah. And that's what's going on right now. The world has a stupid message that they are smartly presenting. We have the smart message that we are stupidly presenting. And that's why God is going to give us a whole new breed of preacher hmm. that doesn't doesn't have any of the, the accoutrements and the, the drapery and is not festooned with, with, with eloquence. They just tell it straight and the fire of God comes on them and it will change society. But, but I believe we aren't going to make Elijah's mistake. I believe that pastors are watching us that are hungry for their church to become a center where hmm. thousands and thousands of people go and are, are saved and discipled. Well, if you want that to be your church, then you need to get this book. You need to get it for your leaders in your church and hand it out like candy and write down the word festooned so that you can use it in daily <laughs> conversation, <laughs> which is why we love Brother Mario. So I remember after 9-11 that um, there was a major uh, magazine, I believe it was, that came out with the headline, America Goes Back to Church. And of course, the concern should have been at that point, what are they going to get whenever they do go back to church? Um, you've mentioned the Walmart phenomenon. Um, what, is, what is the Walmart phenomenon in the modern church? Well, you know, Walmart does not increase the number of people who want sweat socks and beef jerky. This is so good. What they do is they put it all under one roof. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they basically je centralize all the shopping. So the Ma and Pa store that has some of the products that are available, but not all of them, lose out to Walmart. So Walmart does not increase the population of shoppers. It merely redistributes where they buy. That's what happens with some mega churches. The Christian population of the city doesn't go up. The mega church didn't convert anyone, didn't bring more people in. You can't say that in the city of so-and-so we had 10,000 believers, and now that we have a mega church, we've increased how many Christians are in our town. That didn't happen. They merely emptied out other visit places into one. And so... So what it is, it's non-victory. It's, it's uh, you know, let me tell you what the church is like. There was a song years ago that you may be too young to remember, but it was called American Pie. And it talked about how the day the music died. Remember that? Yes. Okay, and, and one of the things, it was talking about British music destroying American rock and roll. That's what Don McLean's opinion was. And, and it, he described the the rolling stones by mentioning jack flash and uh, he says it says the air was filmed with sweet perfume while sergeants played a marching tune talking about the beatles hmm. and then it said this was halftime at a football game this is the paradise it's halftime at a football game and the band started playing and the air was filled with this intoxication to the point where the crowd forgot that there was a second half and turned what should have been a game of two of teams contending for a victory, it turned it into a concert. And he said, the band refused, we got up to dance, dance, but we didn't get a chance because the band refused to yield. That's the American church. Hmm. We're supposed to be contending for souls, yeah. but we turned church into a halftime concert. And we're so enamored with the band, we don't even know. Hey, we're supposed to be getting a halftime talk to go out now and win the victory over the culture. I hope you're enjoying this video. We're going to get right back into it. But first, we want to provide an uncensored platform for voices like this to have a place to come and declare the Word of God to teach you, to instruct you. But we can't do it without your support. 
Here's what I want to challenge you to do. Pray and then go to EncounterToday.com and give an obedience to the Holy Spirit. Take advantage of our special offer. We have a gift we'll send you to thank you for partnering with us, but help us keep this ministry going by going to EncounterToday.com and sowing into the work you're receiving from right now. Let's head back into the interview. Which, which reminds me, by the way, when you start talking about classic music, when I see the title of this book, It's Our Turn Now, it reminds me of a Carmen song, It's Our Time Now. And I mentioned that to you, and then you went ahead and blew my mind by telling me the kind of the story behind that. Because we know we did a video, everybody needs to check it out, showing the story behind Witch's Invitation, which is, which is phenomenal. But tell us about It's Our Time Now, that song with Carmen. What was the story behind that? Well, he was so far ahead of his time that he had a phone in his bus and he would call me and he would say, do you have any new cassette tapes you just preached? And I said, yeah. And one of them was called uh, It's Our Time Now. I preached it at the Cow Palace in San Francisco. Then he would call me back and say, hey, I've turned your sermon into a song. He did that five times. One of them, ironically, was called uh, Kidnap Royalty, which I described how we need to see the, the lowest sinner and the most lost person the way we would look at Kidnap Royalty because they're children of a king that have been kidnapped. And so he wrote it, but he never sent me a dime. So I wrote him and I said, where are my Kidnap Royalties? You know, but yes, he, he took that song and that's what's so ironic. It's Our Time Now was a sermon I preached, and he made it into a very successful video and song, and now it's the book all Four these years later. decades later. It is now yeah. a book that every believer needs to read. We've got to get out. The, the world has been lying well. We've been telling the truth badly. I heard you tell actually a story of Chinese jugglers in relation to Spurgeon. Can you, can you relate that to us? Because I think it's so appropriate for where we are right now. Well, Spurgeon said to a group of pastors, he said, look, the Chinese jugglers have been advertised all over London, and they have a knife throwing act that is very famous, where they have someone stand against the target wall and spread their arms and their fingers, and they will throw a knife and miss the arm, land it is with, within an inch close, but never hit him. He said, that's the way many of you preach. You become experts on missing. Hmm. And, and you can even brag to people, come to my church. Go ahead, spread out your arms. There's no way that you'll be damaged by truth or hurt by anything where I'll, I'll call you to change. And, and the interesting thing is, and I, and I think this needs to be said, America wants the truth. Hmm. So we don't need to be missing. We need to be hitting. Which is why you've talked about this for years, Stolen Thunder, why so many non-Christian voices are being foisted up and, and hailed and followed on social media. People will show up in an auditorium to hear Justin or uh, Jordan Peterson with no light show, right. no praise and worship music, just him expounding what they believe to be true for two hours, three hours. What, how do we turn this around in, in the American church? How does the, the pastor, the evangelist shift after decades of having a certain model in our minds? It's going to be tough to, to get people out of that rut. You know, it, it works like this. You remember when Gideon was told by God, if you want to know that you're going to win, sneak down to the Amalekite camp yeah. and stand next to this tent. And in the tent was a man talking that he had a dream that a barley loaf rolled down the hill and knocked down the tent. And he said, surely this is the army of Gideon and we will be defeated. In a, in a real sense, and I'm looking at Jordan Peterson as a hero, who, by the way, is born the heat of the day and now is the owner of the largest educational website in the world. Oh, wow after everything they've tried to do. And, and so we have to go and listen to Jordan, mm. just, like, just like Gideon went down there and realized, my goodness, Jordan, you're saying what we're supposed to be saying. You actually got what you're saying from us. Mm. When he was on with Joe Rogan, sure. uh, Jordan yeah, Peterson so said, I mean, you know, exactly the same way. Uh, he, Joe Rogan said to him, the Bible, 
is is a very important book. Mm -hmm. And Jordan Peterson looked at him and he says, no. He said, it is the book. Yeah. He said, it's the only book. It's the book from which all other books draw their identity and their worth. And I thought to myself, imagine if a pastor would preach that <laughs> in a pulpit. He would be more doctrinally correct than, than Jordan would be more doctrinally correct than most the of your pastors. seminary graduate. Because, and, and then he made the case, by the way, that no one could refute, an irrefutable case that the Bible isn't just true. He said it's, it's truer than true. It is the basis upon which we communicate truth. And it's hard to get the modern church, as you said, to get unfascinated with these prophetic voices and get back to the prophetic voice, which is the word. How embarrassing is it, Alan, that Jordan Peterson owns a higher regard for the word of God than 90 percent of the American pastors? How embarrassing is that? That is embarrassing. Well, well, he's making total sense. We're in pulpits sounding like we're co quoting strips from a fortune cookie. Hmm. And, and it is absolutely destroyed the, the, the misconception that you can't preach truth, that you have to miss, that you have to go around it, and you have to make people believe that, that, that they benefited from the non-event of your Sunday morning non-sermon with non-scripture and non-conclusions only because you wanted to see a warm body in a pew. Well, the harvest, as you say in your book, is more than what we think it is. What exactly, when we're talking about the harvest, you say the harvest is ripe, and that is the undercurrent. That is what nobody is seeing that is so important, that could change everything, that this harvest is ripe. But what, what are we even talking about when we say harvest? Okay, when we say harvest, and it's important too, that it's, it, we get to the word ripening. That's the part, in the, and I like it, that was in the living translation. S fields of souls are ripening. So when the farmer studies more than anything the timing of when the crop will be ripe, he has to get it before it's ripe because it'll ripen on the way to market. And in order for him to do it, the timing is surgical. Hmm. He has to hire the right people. He has to understand what the weather is going to be like. And he has to have masses of people. We have to do the same thing. I, I, a pastor asked me, why, are, why are no, is no one getting saved in my church? I said, uh, do you have a new converts class? He said, no. Do you have a soul winning class? No. Do you give altar calls? No. I said, well, what you're telling me is that you don't believe anyone can be saved. Hmm. We can't wait until the law starts showing up to our church. We have to go get them. We can't wait till we believe that they're open to us coming to get them. We have to go and get them. Just like Mary went to the tomb, not knowing how she would get to Christ, but the stone was already rolled away. Wow. Faith right now. I can't stand it when preachers preach faith and it never ends in soul winning. Oh, I confess for a car. I confess for the blonde in the choir. I confess for a raise. Not me. I confess that an entire gang of young people are going to be born again. And what I do is I get the tent. I get the permit for the lot before I know the crowd's going to be there. Before I have the money, before I have the opportunity, I assume. And that's what the farmer does. This crop is going to ripen, and I can't sit here hoping it'll ripen. I've got to be ready now. I've got to take action now. That's why in my book, I go to great pains to say, this is how you take your turn. This is how you discern the time. This is what you do. 
Yeah, and not, you got five steps to fighting back, three things you must do to take your turn, uh, four factors to slow down uh, the train that's barreling through this nation. You just step by step on things you can do to really make a difference in this nation. And when, I just feel faith rising now when you're talking about harvest. People are believing for this. You're going to be in Bakersfield, California. You're going to be going back to Colorado Springs. You're going to be in Winston-Salem. We want to have you in Charlotte. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, we're actively looking for a great, great piece of land. We need a piece of land in Charlotte to host a big old Mario Murillo crusade go to encountertoday.com or mar Murillo's website in the link wherever just get us the information so we can yeah. we can uh, make that happen i want you to pray for us we're going to go over to the podcast for a few minutes and dig a little deeper in, in an uncensored fashion about what the lord's been showing you i want to give you this quote from your book before you pray william j federer said the most important thing is to bring people to christ the second most important thing is to preserve the freedom to do the most important thing. Any final words before we pray here for the audience? I really believe that God will give you a love for lost souls, a passion to reach them. And that is 90% of the gift of soul winning is that compassion for those who are lost. Once you've got it, not only do you not need to know the way, that's not important. You will find a way and God will show you a way if that fire is in you to win the lost. Well, pray for us, Brother Morello, that that passion will burn, that we'll be, yield to it. It's already there, that we'll yield to it here. Father, no one is watching this broadcast by accident. Nobody just happened to come across this. Hmm. And God sobered them to understand what it was that this show said that they were supposed to hear and obey. Don't let us walk away unharmed by truth. Don't let us walk away unaffected by the significant moment that we're living in and the role that we play. How Satan doesn't want the church to know what God wants them to do about America. Lord, end the ignorance, put a passion in them, and make this the moment that will change our nation in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 It's our turn now. God's plan to restore America is within our reach. The link is in the description. Get multiple copies. Hand it out like candy. And we're going to head on over to the Encounter Underground podcast to talk a little bit more in an uncensored way with Brother Murillo. Brother Murillo, thanks again for joining us on this program. Thank you, Alan. All right, everybody, check out the links in the description. Get to Bakersfield, California. Find out where these crusades are taking place by going to Brother Murillo's website and getting all the information, catching up on the blog. You're going to love it, and we'll see you next time right here on Encounter Today. As we head into 2023, you can hear it being spoken across all streams, the power and the significance behind the number 20. Well, on February the 3rd, that's 2323, we are having a prophetic gathering in Charlotte, North Carolina with the amazing best selling author and prophetic voice, Chad Norris from the Garden Greenville. This is going to be a powerful time in the Lord that I believe is essential for tearing open the heavens over your life and releasing the breakthrough that you need. So I want you to go to encountertoday.com to get more information about our amazing prophetic gathering with Chad Norris on 23. Two, three. We'll see you there.